There is a secretive legal system which facilitates the transfer of wealth from the poor world to the rich and does so in the name of investment and development. The so-called Investor State Dispute Settlement, or ISDS as more commonly known, allows corporations and investors to sue sovereign governments. Activist groups around the world are fighting to dismantle this system which has no discernible benefit for states or their taxpayers. The media is slowly catching up to what is going on. In a Guardian investigation titled The Obscure Legal System That Lets Corporations Sue Countries, it outlines that it was a group of German businessmen in the late 1950s who first conceived of a way to protect their overseas investment as a wave of developing countries gained independence from European colonial powers. Led by Deutsche Bank chairman Hermann Abs, they called their proposal an international magna carta for private investors. Right now, in 2015, the system has metamorphosed into a major weapon in the armory of corporations to stop sovereign governments enacting legislation or regulations which they don't like. In March, WikiLeaks released part of TPP. The New York Times broke the story in their piece titled Trans-Pacific Partnership Seen as Door for Foreign Suits Against US. They reported that an ambitious 12-nation trade accord pushed by President Obama would allow foreign corporations to sue the United States government for actions that undermine their investment expectations and hurt their business, according to a classified document. What the article didn't understand is that the US is already vulnerable to lawsuits based on the hundreds of investment treaties it is already party to. But, by some small miracle, the US has never lost an ISDS case. When the TPP full text was eventually released, a top Australian lawyer called the ISDS provisions in it a weapon of legal destruction, as shown here in The Guardian. In this article in the Huffington Post, Corporate Courts, a big red flag on trade agreements, the author writes that, as a result of NAFTA-style investor protections that are part of so-called trade agreements, giant corporations can and do sue governments for trying to pass laws that protect their citizens from harmful chemicals, ban harmful products and protect the rights of working people, among other things. Corporations even sue governments for passing laws that might cause the investor in the corporations to make a bit less money, like raising the minimum wage. There has been some pushback, with Senator Elizabeth Warren leading the charge against the ISDS provisions in TPP, as shown here in Time. It reads, Two decades ago, when NAFTA was ratified, multinational corporations were smaller and less powerful than they are today. Her case is that as those interests have gotten bigger and bigger, they've gotten more litigious. In the four decades from 1959 to 2002, there were fewer than 100 ISDS cases worldwide. Between 2010 and 2013 alone, there were more than 200. Half of all the world's countries have now been sued at the International Centre for the Settlement of Investment Disputes, or the ICSID, the premier ISDS institution and most obscure branch of the World Bank. In Europe, it has become increasingly controversial. Reuters reports that the French Trade Secretary said he would never allow private tribunals in the pay of multinational companies to dictate the policies of sovereign states. The ISDS provisions in the EU-US mega free trade deal, TTIP, are the main stickler for the European Commission and the huge activist campaign that has sprung up against the deal. Under pressure from this movement, the EU has now announced it will postpone ISDS discussions until the end of the negotiations around the TTIP, though it has refused to rule it out. The Parliament magazine published an article, TTIP, EU Commission Unveils Replacement for Controversial ISDS, and reveals that the European Trade Commissioner, Cecilia Malmström, has announced plans for an investment court system to replace ISDS in all future EU investment negotiations with publicly appointed arbitrators. The justification from the beginning for this system has been that it is necessary to protect and therefore promote foreign investment in poor countries and with it development and poverty reduction for the world's people. But this system is increasingly being used by corporations to challenge and subvert environmental and social protections around the world in the pursuit of profit. From changing environmental protections in Germany to challenging South Africa's post-apartheid settlement, the system is spreading and mutating and in the process becoming an increasingly influential factor in policy making around the world. This is shown in this Financial Times article, Trade Deals, Toxic Talks, which says that the ISDS system can lead to regulatory chill, where governments, afraid of having to fight such cases, stop themselves from introducing regulations or passing laws. Almost 75% of all suits filed in ICSID's history were filed in the last decade. This is the era of investor-state disputes. 
Tobacco company Philip Morris rearranged its assets to become a Hong Kong investor in order to use the investor state dispute settlement provisions in the Australia-Hong Kong Bilateral Investment Treaty. It argues that plain packaging on cigarettes constitutes a form of expropriation. The company is suing Uruguay for the same reason, as shown here in this NPR article. Australian newspaper, the Saturday paper, reports that at least one claim made by Philip Morris is true. The company is bigger than Uruguay. Uruguay's GDP is just $50 billion, of which government accounts for less than one third. The piece goes on to quote Matthew Myers, president of the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, an organization that is helping fund Uruguay's legal costs. He says, in just the last two years, we've seen cigarette companies threaten Namibia, Togo, Uganda, with lawsuits they said would cost millions of dollars to defend in an effort to intimidate a country into not even passing tobacco laws. The article continues that in a recent annual report, Philip Morris acknowledges Australia's plain packaging legislation as the most significant legal setback of the previous year. It also boasts to its shareholders that its various international trade actions against Australia are having their desired effect by deterring other countries, New Zealand being one example, from implementing such extreme regulatory measures, at least until the various challenges to the Australian legislation are resolved. Corporations don't always win. Roughly a third of all ICSID cases settle. The remaining two thirds roughly split evenly between those decided in favour of and those decided against the investor. But settlements can be very powerful and poorer countries may find themselves under particular pressure to make concessions and close the case. Mounting a defence can by itself cost millions of dollars. ICSID prides itself on being the most transparent of investor state tribunals but its hearings are, with rare exceptions, closed to the public and many documents kept secret. Moreover, negotiations over the treaties and free trade acts that enable investors to mount disputes against states in the first place are notoriously secretive. Some of the cases beg a belief. In 2007, a group of Italian investors sued South Africa at ICSID for more than $350 million, saying the country's post-apartheid black economic empowerment policies violated their investor rights, as shown here in the Financial Times. Three years later, the companies withdrew their complaints after the government exempted them from certain rules. The Marlin and Red Graniti operations control some 80% of the South African granite industry. Their case is seen as emblematic of how corporations can use the ISDS system and the threat of a multi-million dollar claim to limit government's ability to pursue public policies and structural reforms. Even the Italian embassy in South Africa Places which usually support their corporate interests took a hands-off approach, as shown here in the Mining Weekly article. El Salvador is currently battling a $300 million case mounted at ICSID by Pacific Rim, a Canadian gold mining company recently bought out by Australian miner Oceana Gold. The company said El Salvador violated its investor rights after the tiny Central American country introduced a temporary ban on metal mining, citing concerns over widespread water contamination and environmental destruction. The final phase of the case began on El Salvador's Independence Day. This is not a coincidence. Salvadoran representatives chose the date and are framing the case as a test of how much control the country has over its own destiny. At the moment, officials feel their hands are tied and fear, for example, that making the temporary ban on mining permanent could leave them open to a dozen more such suits. This Guardian article calls it an assault on democratic governance. Meanwhile, residents of San Sebastian, as reported here by McClatchy in northeastern El Salvador, have struggled to access justice or hold companies to account for environmental destruction wrought over a century mining the mountains for gold. Water is severely contaminated, soil laced with cyanide. Germany is also at court, battling a landmark claim lodged by Swedish energy company Vattenfall. The investor is demanding billions of dollars in compensation after Germany decided to phase out nuclear power in the wake of the Fukushima disaster, as the premier German broadsheet Der Spiegel shows. This case is ongoing, but Germany has faced Vattenfall before. In 2007, the company went to exit in protest over environmental restrictions placed by the city of Hamburg on its new coal plant. Germany settled and the plant is now up and running, seen by some as a symbol of how corporations have been able to trump local democratic decision making via the ISDS system. In London and Washington DC, there is also an army of law firms and financiers who profit from the ISDS system. 
Law firms and investors use strategies such as treaty shopping for the best investor rights protections and structuring assets or filing claims accordingly. And there is now a growing number of third party funders who see arbitration claims as a new asset class and highly lucrative business opportunity. With millions of dollars at their disposal, third party funders assist companies by agreeing to fund their claim with non recourse loans in exchange for a share of the final award. You look at the rapid rise of investment cases and you think, wow, the world didn't really expect this. And you wonder, is third party funding going to put this on steroids? Said Catherine Rogers, professor of law at Penn State University, in this article, Speculate and Arbitrate to Accumulate, in the International Bar Association's magazine. Burford Capital, one of the largest of such financiers, saw its profits grow ninefold from 2010 to 2011, while another fund which invests in claims, Juridica, saw profits grow nearly 600% in the same period. The system has become a naked way to make money and at the expense of some of the poorest people on the planet.